Hello everybody, this is the first lecture in the electroanalytical part of your further analytical chemistry module. Here are a few textbooks that I've dipped into. Quantitative chemical analysis I've followed quite closely, so if you get that one, you'll um, get quite a bit of help with anything you don't understand and there's some good exercises in there to give you practice. Fundamentals of Analytical Chemistry is the book that Deb uses. Um, I've looked in there a bit, it's pretty good. Uh, there's a few things in there that give you some nice extra reading. And then the sort of Bible of electrochemistry is uh, Electrochemical Methods by Bard and Faulkner. Um, it's very detailed, but I mean, if there's anything that you wanted to know that you didn't know, you, you'll find it in there. So this first lecture is going to be a recap of some of the background things that you need to know before you start. Andrew's lectures are very good. If there's anything that I mention that you're not sure about, please go back and have a look into Andrew's videos. I'm not going to be too heavy on the physical chemistry because we've only got a few lectures. and I really want to focus on the analytical aspect as this is an analytical chemistry module. OK, so here we go. Okay, so let's start by considering a simple galvanic cell connected with a salt bridge and a potentiometer. From the standard electrode potentials of the hydrogen electrode on the left of the diagram and the silver serum chloride electrode on the right of the diagram, we know that the electrons are going to flow from the left side to the right side. Remember, oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain. And reduction occurs at the cathode, red cat. Hydrogen gas is losing two electrons to become two protons. So it is becoming oxidized. Those electrons are flowing through the potentiometer to the silver electrode and reducing silver chloride to solid silver and releasing a chloride ion into the potassium chloride solution. So red cat, the cathode is the silver silver chloride electrode and the anode is the platinum hydrogen electrode. So from an analytical chemist point of view, what we're really interested in is the reading on the potentiometer, the potential difference, the concentration of chloride in the right half cell and the pH in the left tau cell, which is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So in a roundabout way of trying to find a relationship between these three things, let's consider what happens when we take out the potentiometer and the salt bridge. Now, just because we've broken the circuit, it doesn't mean that there's no exchange of electrons happening in the two half cells, but it does mean that there is no net change in the concentrations of the cell because both reactions are happening backwards and forwards at an equal rate. Okay, so about this time of the evening, I like to introduce an analogy. Um, so the electrons are driven through the circuit by the potential difference. This is the electrical energy available to do work as a result of connecting the two half reactions. It's not always the easiest concept to visualize. So by way of an analogy, let's consider two large volumes of water stored in equally sized boxes with a dam between them. The body of water on the right is the Atlantic with a greater volume and as a result, a greater potential energy due to its greater height to the med on the left. Opening the dam lets water flow. The rate of flow will be proportional to the potential energy that's stored in the Atlantic. And if we measure the flow, we could in theory work out the height. And we can use this potential energy to drive a turbine and do work. Now that is pretty much what we're doing in a battery. The flow of current does work proportional to the potential or voltage and lights the bulb. However, this also consumes the half cell reagents and increases the concentration of the products in the half cells. It's gradually they approach an equilibrium position which makes the forward reaction less favorable. 
just like when the Atlantic sinks, its potential energy is steadily used up and the difference in potential between the Med and the Atlantic slowly disappears. So, final bit of analogy, I promise. In order to only measure the flow and assess the potential, we drill a very small hole in the dam. We can still measure the flow. It's still proportional to the potential energy difference, but it will take years and years for the measurement to change the outcome of the measurement. Now, I say all this because a lot of people get confused about how you can measure potential without changing the composition of the cell. The fact is you can't, but the rate at which you change it is so slow, you will hardly notice it. Right, so why is that? It's because the potentiometer has a huge resistance, which only lets a small current flow. A bit like the tiny hole we drilled in the enormous Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so back to our cell. So now we've put in the potentiometer and the potentiometer completes the circuit. A tiny, tiny current flows. And this allows the electrons generated when hydrogen is reduced to flow through to the silver electrode. At the silver-silver chloride interface, these electrons reduce the silver in silver chloride to solid silver metal, releasing a chloride into the KCl aqueous solution. As oxidation continues, protons will build up in the left-hand solution, and as reduction continues, chloride ions will build up in the right hand solution. This build up of charge has to be balanced, otherwise repulsion will stop the reactions from taking place. We do this by putting in a salt bridge, which allows charge to flow from both the potassium chloride solution as chloride ions go through the salt bridge, and for positive ions to flow across the salt bridge into the potassium chloride solution. Don't be misled into thinking that chloride ions generated at the cathode are likely to end up all the way over in the hydrogen electrode solution. What's most likely to happen is the ions in the salt bridge will pull themselves along a little like when you pull a string of pearls. The beads will shuffle up and then just a few ions from either solution will end up on the ends of the salt bridge. What we're measuring in both the water analogy and in the electrical circuit is current. In the water analogy, we measure the flow of water with a flow meter. This calculates how many meters squared of water have flown through it, and it divides that up into units of time, for example, meters cubed per second. In a cell, the rate of flow is measured by the galvanometer. The units are coulombs per second, and coulombs are proportional to the number of electrons or units of charge that have been transferred. So for each coulomb passed, roughly 96 and a half thousand moles of charge are passed. This is either electrons transferred or positive charge transferred. Remember that current is the flow of positive charge from plus to minus and electrons flow from minus to plus. When current passes through the galvanometer it produces a deflection proportional to the current flowing and we can use this reading to either work out the current or where it passes through a known resistance we can calculate the potential difference. In a potentiometer, the resistance is set extremely high so that only negligible current flows. So that's briefly how the cell works. What we want to know is how we can use this information of the potential difference 
to work out the concentration of solutions so we can begin to think about making census. And that's exactly what we're going to look at in the next lecture, where we're going to introduce the Nernst equation as a means of relating the reading on the potentiometer and the concentration of ions in the two solutions.